uh, anchor uh, will be on the panel, uh, and we'll have someone from Microsoft, and we'll also have someone from uh, my organization uh, where I work, which is the Merit Group, which is a PR agency, integrated PR um, creative agency. But we're also really dedicated um, not just to serving clients, but to really serving you know and contributing to the you know deeper understandings and uh, thought leadership around our industry, around our sector. So, so I thank them for supporting this work as well. Um, you know, I was thinking about this session, and I guess what I want to say in terms of the lay of the land, in terms of how we go about the next uh, hour or so, really want this to be as much of a discussion involving you as possible. I mean, I'm going to say a little something at the beginning, a question or two just to get things started, but, but again, really as much of an integrated conversation we can have, I think that'd be fantastic, um, especially because so much of my thinking about this discussion today has to do with the fact that we had a very similar panel two years ago, um, probably right here in this room, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how many of you were actually here for the, the conference two years ago? Okay. Um, for those of you who were here, maybe you feel this way. For those of you who weren't, I definitely would love to sort of convey one of the biggest pieces of value that I got out of this particular conference uh, 24 months ago was that the timing couldn't have been better um, because, you know, we were, uh, two years ago, th th these issues of populism and character assassination were freshly relevant. I mean, they didn't happen overnight, but they became, I think, like one author said, bankruptcy. It happened slowly, then all of a sudden. Um, and, and I think that in populism and a lot of the things that we saw, we were in that all of a sudden moment. Um, and even better for a conference, this was in March, um, you know, five months after the election, three months or two months, <clears throat> you know, uh, since the actual inauguration. So it was that moment right after the flash bulb of shock where we're starting to get our sense around what just happened. Um, and this was before Hillary Clinton came up with a book of that name. We were here talking about what happened. And I think that what's interesting is that so much of the value, as I mentioned, had to do with that we were trying to make sense of what just happened. So that rather than forensically going back and saying, Whoa, you know, what, 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 what is the world I'm living within? We were starting to see through these conference and the sessions that we had over the course of those couple days, a taxonomy, a framework for understanding the world. Um, and to me, that was very powerful. And so what's powerful for me today is that we're back here with the same kinds of issues before us, but with 24 months, two years, and we haven't checked in since then, not like a group like this. So it's been two years since we've compared notes. It's been two years since we started a, you know, an interdisciplinary uh, approach, a journey, to try to sort of understand what's going on. We talked about populism, we talked about character, uh, political character, we talked about the media's role. We did all of that two years ago, and we're here back now to do it again, and that's what's most interesting and energizing for me is that we have two years of research, two years of perspective, two years of comparing notes between different disciplines that may not have communicated before, and then really just, that's, that's my setup for these folks and for all of you, is that this is a progress report, and we no longer can just sort of riff on the shock and riff on the you know, failure of imagination. We now are in a position where we began to see the framework of what this world is, and now I really want to know what the contours are now that we've had some time to look and examine that. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, Selena Zito is uh, closest to me right here. She's a CNN contributor, a national political reporter at the Washington Examiner. She's also co-author of a book, uh, The Great Revolt, Inside the Populist Coalition Reshaping American Politics. And then we have um, Stephen Farnsworth, Director of uh, Center of Leadership and Media Studies at the University of Mary Washington. Actually, I should be doing it in order here. Jeremy Mayer, Associate Professor in, of the School of Policy and Government at uh, Mason. So, so the three of you, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. Um, so let me sort of ask this out to all of you, and you can sort of tag team or figure out how to you know, tackle this. But this idea of that shock and trying to start to understand, and you know, psychologists, some, some of them call it sense making, that we need to make sense of things. So if I ask you very simply, what sense have we made of everything now, two years later? I'll start yeah. Can you hear me or do you need to use the mic? Oh, yeah, I'm loud. 
Can you hear me now? Yay. OK, so can I ask you guys a question? Who, raise your hand if you were shocked on November 9th, 2016, when you woke up. Raise your hand if you live within the six counties that surround Washington, DC. That's probably why you were shocked. Uh, raise your hand if you got outside of the six counties surrounding Washington, DC, leading up to the election. I would say leading to a, on a back road, not an interstate, not a, not a, not a plane, and you were still shocked? Okay. Uh, one of the things I, I've been writing about, the, I've been warning about this populism since January 2006. It's the first time I wrote about it. It's the first time I detected it. Uh, I, as a reporter, uh, well, first of all, I should tell you this firsthand. People always think that I understood Trump was going to win because I liked him. I don't vote in elections that I cover. But I do listen to people, and I did understand that this was happening. Not because I liked him, not because I wanted him to win, but because I live in Pittsburgh, which is the Paris of Appalachia, right? Uh, and, and I understood. Has anybody ever been to Pittsburgh? OK. We're real unique. <laughs> you know, people think, oh, big city. No, you know. I mean, every Monday after Thanksgiving, we have, all of our schools are closed because everybody goes hunting. So it's a completely different culture. It's not better, it's not worse, it's different. And, and so, is anybody still shocked that this, is, that this might happen again? You need to come on a road trip with me. <laughs> you need to, one of the things I did as a journalist was teach at Harvard which is really funny, because I grew up on the wrong side of town. But what I did with the class was I took them outside of Harvard. They did, I did not teach one of the classes in Cambridge. I took those kids, and I took them out to four different parts of the country and had them live there. No planes, no trains, no highways. They took all the back roads so they could see how the country was changing. They didn't stay in a nice hotel. They stayed in a bed and breakfast. So the first person that they met was a small business owner. They learned how to shoot a gun. They learned how to work in a steel mill. They learned how to work in a pottery factory. They went to church. These are the best, in the, allegedly the best and the brightest in the country. All of us need to do more of that. We need to know each other better. So uh, I, I don't know why I told you all that, but I think it's really important that we should stop being shocked about this and be a little bit more open-minded. Once you get that, there's, a, there's another microphone there and see if we can, um, when you raised your so, hand. So uh, you... one thing I think we've learned in the last two years, and there were signs of this already in March of 2017, is that populism is a worldwide phenomenon and it is rising in the same way that it was rising in the 30s in the sense that it, that was also a global moment. And I think it's important not to just focus on the cases that we all know because it's so obvious, like Erdogan in Turkey or in the Philippines. Uh, sometimes populism comes out and says, I'm, I'm what you think I am. But I'd draw your attention to two cases that really prove it, and that is Israel and China. Because Netanyahu is the same guy that he was when he wasn't that different from a normal Likud leader, right? I mean, Netanyahu was not all that different from Sharon. He spoke English a hell of a lot better without that thick accent, but policy-wise and within the context of Israeli politics, he wasn't that different. Today, Netanyahu has absorbed populism and fear of the other and xenophobia in a way that he never did before. And he's allying himself with the most hateful elements within the Israeli right in a way that even Sharon never did. And then China, right? Uh, Xi Jinping is so different from all the post dang leaders of China. Uh, he is uh, emphasizing himself in a way that no Chinese communist leader has done since Mao. And so if two such incredibly different political systems, one a communist dictatorship with a capitalist crony economy, and the other a fairly well-functioning liberal democracy, if we leave out the Palestinians for a moment who don't get to vote uh, within the territories, are both moving towards this kind of populism, then America is not a shining city on the hill, as Reagan said. We're part of a global trend in which 
the familiar faces of populism with all of its hatred of intellectuals, with all of its rejection of ideology, with its uh, reverence for a strong man, with its xenophobia and hatred of the outsider, rising all across the globe. And I think of, of all the things we might take away two years in is that this is clearly a global type. It's interesting that because when we when you just hearing you talk about these situations in these particular countries, it's very much focused in these cases around the particular leader. You know, if we're talking about China or if we're talking about Israel, if we're talking about the U.S., which is why I think the the populism in the United Kingdom is so interesting to me, because, like you say, you mention all these leaders and the reverence for strongman, and then there's Theresa May. And, 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 and that, that, so there's populism is roiling that country. Some would say it's, it's causing it to be dysfunctional. Some would say that about the United States, but it's a very different dynamic because I, I, guess, I guess this is my question to all of you is that if we look at the case of the United Kingdom and the, and, and the political dynamics seem to be different, certainly the personalities show that populism isn't just, just for strongmen, I guess is, is, is my way of saying it. So, so what does that kind of twist on populism that we see in the UK and with the, with the current leadership and the fact that, you know, her role in that, what does that tell you about populism and, and its spread? Well, I guess the key thing to remember is that we should emphasize the word current leadership of the UK. <laughs> the reality for uh, Theresa May and her resistance to the populist forces within her own caucus does not necessarily bode well for her future as prime minister. We have a situation right now in the UK where there is no majority for anything. Get out, stay, have a deal, don't have a deal. All of these are bad options in terms of where the prime minister is. And her inability to move her caucus in the direction of any one of these suggests that, uh, that we're really in the opening act of the populist question in the UK, in, in my view at least. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, the next prime minister, I think, will be the pivotal question in terms of the uh, staying power, if you will, of, of populism in the UK or the fact that, uh, that it's beaten back. I think that, that we, uh, looking at Th Theresa May, maybe looking at a more tra traditional transactional British prime minister, but that's not to say that the next one would be cut from the same cloth. And so, um, so I think that the, the way in which we're looking at the UK, at least right now, uh, has to come with a huge caveat for the next act of this story. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to turn it out uh, to, to the, all of us to start uh, crowdsourcing some questions. Um, sure, go ahead. You, yeah. I, I'm oh, sorry, I saw, I saw his hand up first. I'm sorry, but hang on.
Okay. Right. I, I, so on populism, one of the things uh, you, people don't understand, and you're absolutely right, um, uh, May didn't cause this. She's the result of it. Or Brexit was a result of it. Just as Donald Trump did not cause this conservative populist coalition that now exists, he is the cause of it. And, it, and just like Bernie Sanders did not cause um, the, the leftist um, populism that's going on, he is the result of it. So we keep sort of naming, putting, blaming it on people. What populism is today is that at times very healthy skepticism of all things big. And it's not limited just to government. It also is, 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 has broadened into a lot of different things and parts of our culture. Education, entertainment, sports. Uh, people are skeptical of the decision makers in our culture, whether it's government or politics or sports or entertainment, whatever, because they all come, sorry, from the same sort of super zip codes. Um, and, the, and the same people are, are the decision makers. Uh, we, I argue, we argue in the book that if government or politics or entertainment or sports, I mean, if there are more people in, in media, let's just take my profession. My profession has an unbelievable lack of diversity in it. And that's not just racial. That's also like everyone goes to an Ivy League school that's in, um, that's in media. Well, if you're reporting and understanding people and you all come from an Ivy League school, you're not going to understand the people you report about. You end up making fun of them because you don't get them. We need more people in media that went to a state school, that sit in a pew every Sunday, that own a gun, that are pro-life. We don't have those diversity of backgrounds. And I would say the same within um, our culture. Look at the NFL. Does anybody know where the NFL is um, located? Park Avenue, New York. I went, well, now think about the decision, the, the sort of two years of awfulness that they had in PR. It's probably because everyone in Park Avenue office went to the same school and live in the same zip code. I would say that they'd be better off to have their headquarters in, in Canton, Ohio, where the Hall of Fame is. You had more diversity of opinion, opinion there. They could have handled that problem with the, with the kneeling in like five minutes and not gone two years and lost 8% of their, of their, um, of their, um, their um, audience in the first year and 9% the next year. You have to have more diversity of backgrounds in decision making. That's what the part of what this populism is about. Let me ask um, um, one more question because you mentioned the media and then get back to the audience um, for, for, for additional questions. Um, because, you know, again, we're sort of revisiting these issues of, you know, political character and those mechanisms, populism, that we talked a lot about and the future of the media. So the media comes up. I'm remembering back to two years ago and it was still almost like the media was still stop, trying to stop the head spins. And and getting engaging and trying and trying to understand how to respond to enemy of the people terms that would come their way. And by that time, I think it, it had come their way because uh, I remember mentioning that in our remarks two years ago about that. Again, it's been two years. We we got to if if we're going to be reasonable as practitioners and uh, you know observers and hopefully boosters of the media, we we should we should have more to talk about and wonder. We should have more insight. By now, and, and one of the things I've seen, which I've been really pleased by, is that this proliferation of fake news has created a new environment within which certain news organizations can use journalistic integrity almost as a value proposition um, to differentiate themselves from other organizations. And that value proposition is tied into the idea that you're probably having to pay more for it. And that's why you see, you know, it, journalism is worth it. Um, and why in the New York Times, when they're putting those ads out, they talk about the truth is worth it, um, and even tell about you know how many bureaus. So, so there's there's a there's a distinct value proposition there, um, and that and then there's other business models for journalism where like a company like Amazon can own the Washington Post. So so in that sense, um, whether you've got a quarter of a million subscribers flooding to the New York Times after the election, or if you got you know 
uh, the, uh, the Washington Post now owned by a company that probably doesn't have to worry. Amazon does not own the Washington Post. Yes, Bezos. Jeff Bezos, yes. Thank you for clarifying. Um, but you have the Washington Post in an environment owned by an individual who is not, who, who is given it, or who says he's giving it, trying to insulate it from some of these other forces. So I, I, this is my long roundabout way of saying, let's, wh where are we with the media? What's the good news and the bad news about it? Uh, full disclosure, I used to be a journalist. I worked for 10 years in daily journalism before I went to graduate school. Um, and in part, I went to graduate school because I was concerned about the economic model of daily newspaper journalism. And uh, I thought I was right. I found out over time I was really, really right. Um, the big problem with journalism today that I would emphasize is the fact that there is not a viable economic model for papers away from those marquee national names that you've mentioned. The Washington Post and the New York Times will always be able to sell an elite audience, paying an elite price, or an elite product. I'm much more worried about, say, my old newspaper, the Kansas City Star. And I'm even more worried about papers smaller than that, where they once upon a time had 50,000 or 20,000 subscribers, but now they have a tiny fraction of that. Uh, the papers of that size are often flirting with bankruptcy or have been bought by larger companies that are basically run and dump. They buy the papers, they take on a lot of debt, they lay off a bunch of reporters, and they sell the product at a discount. This is a financial disaster for journalism, and this is journalism where people are. I'm very concerned about the lack of local journalism and the extent to which it creates an environment where uh, corruption can flourish in local and state government because of the lack of monitoring. And so I think that uh, this is not an ideological argument at all. It's a question of who's watching the government. And so this is a challenge, I think, that is really, really severe. And it is one that isn't going away because people are used to getting things for nothing. I mean, you can watch the local TV news and you don't have to pay for it. And although I would argue that the quality of print journalism is far, far better than the quality of television journal, I've written books about this topic. Um, and so I have a, a view of that besides having been a print journalist. I do think that this is a major, major concern. And so the, uh, the concern turning back more now to character assassination is that when you're looking at reporters who have to do two or three beats compared to what the reporters did 10 years ago, um, you're going to see them run in the direction of fast journalism. You're going to see them run in the direction of, of insults or the back and forth, not going into the documents, not going into the records, not doing the kind of investigation that we all benefit from when a corrupt politician is exposed, when a special deal is made public. And we don't get that information now because they simply can't afford to tell a reporter you know, you've got a week to dig into the records and see what you get on this story. It doesn't exist anymore. And so it's much easier to say, we think this person is low energy, or we think this person is, um, has little hands, or whatever is going on in the national politics. Because once you get away from the handful of elite organizations that have the resources to do serious investigation, we're all the poorer for it. Absolutely. I was a victim of that. I lost my job at the Pittsburgh newspaper. We went from a newspaper that had 400 people. I think there's two dozen people there left there now. That's in two years. There's 40,000 uh, newspaper jobs that have been lost in the past four years. Who's going who's gonna to hold the city council or the water authority or the sewer authority or the school boards? These are some of the most corrupt institutions that exist in our country. And that local news, that person who coaches your kid's baseball team but is also busting their backside to chase down corruption is gone. That job is gone, but also that benefit that you had as a citizen is gone. The death of local newspapers is the worst thing to happen to this country. I agree with the, both of those comments entirely, uh, but I'd raise a th another issue involving populism, and that is that populists everywhere always have always directed assaults on the truth tellers, on the institutions that are about consensus, about saying what is the inflation rate and, and what happened yesterday. So universities, but the media as well. And I'd like you to think about the way populists attack truth. Like when Trump 
says something that is manifestly untrue, right? I don't know if he's doing it intentionally, but it works so well because it activates the antibodies of our democracy. The media truth tellers have to say, well, actually, your inauguration wasn't the largest in history. And actually, even something so stupid as, did you say Tim Apple or Tim Cook Apple? And remember that within 24 hours, Trump had two different explanations that are mutually contradictory. And one that he was trying to save time and the other that he actually said, Cook, you just can't hear it. And there's videotape people. And again, I don't know if he's doing this on purpose, but what it does is it exhausts the resources of the truth tellers. Like antibodies in a, in a, in a patient that has MS, you keep going out to the inflammation sites and, and you get tired. And, and what about the really well, it doesn't big just lives? exhaust them, but it also, it also defines their role as sort of just snarks, right. you know? And, and I, there's Tattletales a, or, you know. And, and the Nazis did this as well too, the, this attack on the media as the lying press, the Lugenpresse. You know, this, 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 this is not new, as well as trolling. Trump is the world's greatest troller. And trolling was something that the Nazis did because you could always sort of, oh, we were joking about that. It does two really good things. First of all, it activates people that are listening to you and know you're telling the truth and they enjoy it. And it also inf infuriates your adversaries and you can always jump back and say, oh, you're so sensitive. Why are you getting so upset? Oh, he's just an exaggerator. That would never, it's like a trial balloon going up and also just at gasoline on the fire. So absolutely we should be worrying about local TV, or sorry, local newspapers. But if you, if when we were sitting here two years ago, if you'd ask who's going to be on the front lines of populism, we would have said the media is going to become the enemy of the people. Okay, questions from the audience? Uh, uh, yeah, you've been waiting. That's, yeah. The second problem is the problem of causality. And the causality, the line of causality has to be much more extended. What is the common, the, the common between Trump and Brexit? English had the notice given explanation. It's the, the left behind thesis. What is the analogy of Nazism is very interesting. What is the analogy, but we should extend it. What was the causal factor of Nazism? Was it propaganda? No. Was it populism? No. It was a financial crisis. The financial crisis brought Trump, the financial crisis brought... The, also, what are the reasons? Why do we have Brexit? Why do we, all, why do we almost, have, almost have Brexit in Greece? Because of the financial crisis, because of the structural problems of the European Union, and these structural problems and the German hegemony that constructs anti hegemonic forces, that the government they cannot enact upon them, people enact upon them. European Union is one blow away from destruction, and it's called Marine Le Pen. Once Marines get elected, European Union, bye-bye. Okay, thank you. I'm not, I'm not sure about the question, but this is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no question. All right. Um, I guess maybe just pass the mic. It's all on. Uh... I can form that as a question, by the way, so let me do that. So the, one of the things that we had, to, we're using populism on this panel in a sort of a, uh, a negative sense, but there is, of course, the original sense we had in the morning, which was that it was the populist party and it was a critique of, of economic elites. So if we thought of it in this way, if you think about the populism of the late 19th century as a reaction to the Depression of 1873, and you think about the various forms of populism that were a reaction to the Great Depression, what has, uh, is it fair to say that the Great Recession is unresolved and we're still trying to work through those, those issues? Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that point up. Um, the, uh, and the panic of um, 1893 also. Yeah, um, those those really impacted. Uh, the other really great populist election in uh, in in American history was between uh, William Jennings Bryan and uh, William McKinley. Uh, what what is similar is, and I think it hits a little bit to what you were talking about, is that these things happen when there's yes an economic recession or depression, but also when there's great change in the economy. So in the 18, um, 1890s, it was the Industrial Revolution. Things were changing dramatically. Uh, and the same thing is going on here. We are changing dramatically. We are in a great technological 
uh, revolution. You know, think about this. M men in this, 20% of men in this country make their living driving something from point A to point B. And they make a good living doing that. Within five years, half of them won't have their job because of technology. Technology is changing almost every single person's um, future in what they're going to be able to do economically. And so that kind of instability also leads to populism because we look to the, to the sort of experts and, and uh, as to you should have been prepared for this. We're not prepared for this. And, and it's impacting all of our lives. And, and I mean, everything we do is right here. I mean, we can even have our food delivered from here. It's just crazy. Right. But it's impacting all of our lives. And I think that's part of the populism. I think it's important to remember, too, that there's also the issue of hope. Uh, one of the sort of painful realities of the economic crisis of this last decade is the sense that this isn't temporary, that this is a permanent change in the economy. Um, I'll, just to use an example, my, uh, my uncle, who was a Polish immigrant, came to America, went to high school, fought in Korea, got a job at Ford, you know, and that's a good life. And then, you know, but his sons, my cousins, don't have those kinds of opportunities. They're in towns where Ford has picked up and left. You know? And so the reality for a lot of younger people, and I'll define those as younger than I am, if that's okay, uh, is that the uh, economic opportunities that used to exist in one town after another across this country no longer exist. And so you have to give up everything you know in your community to move somewhere else, perhaps, to find a way to take care of your family. And there has been no good answer from the left or the right in this country about how to fix that. And so whereas in, say, in the case of the Depression, there was a sense that this was going to get better eventually, that this sort of status quo can be restored, uh, there isn't that sense today. Those jobs are gone to Mexico or China or Vietnam or wherever they might be, and Americans are simply having to deal with the consequences of sort of a hollowed-out city. I mean, when you think about what one salary would have bought in America in 1973 and what one average salary buys in America now, you can see why there's this anger. And when you add to that the sense that those jobs aren't coming back, as much as people might say, oh, we're going to reopen coal mines, a lot of people, if you really ask them, they know that, that the coal economy is not a viable long-term solution. Uh, that's a real, real downer for people. And when they think about the answers that come from the traditionally um, conservative or traditionally liberal parties of this country and how either, neither one of them can really say, we can make tomorrow better, you can understand why there's so much anger and why there's so much frustration. And that's not just an American problem. It's a European problem, too, for exactly the same reasons. There are places where there can be lower cost employees hired, and you just move the stuff back and forth to save money for the companies. Um, and a question from the audience. If, if the media today can't or won't hold these power structures accountable through thorough, honest uh, investigations, and if everything in the media and social media and public discourse encourages further polarization, further divisions, and even dehumanizations of other uh, cultures within the United States, who then should be responsible for answering these questions, addressing the identifying and addressing problems in a way that does not cause for the frictions but kind of has a unifying effect. And who will bring this um, tradition of classical liberalism to both parties and both cultures? Uh, well, I don't, I don't know what the answer is for my profession. I, I think we're still figuring that out. Uh, I know our job is to be good steward, to be good stewards, and to um, to hold truth to power. Um, but we are going through a dramatic change, like many other institutions or many other um, professions, and and that's yet to be seen. 
uh, and as you said, I think the, Was the Washington Post and the New York Times are going to be fine, but I think those lo I think local um, in local news organizations are the things that I'm deeply concerned about because it, it, it allows corruption to just go amok. I, um, I very much. Uh, sorry, you done? So I very much like what Steve had to say about hope. And I think we should all remember what FDR brought to the table. It wasn't just his policy proposals, which were incredibly detailed, and many of them not all that successful, uh, but he definitely brought hope. And there was populism on the rise, on the right wing with Father Coughlin and on the left wing with Huey Long, who FDR once said when he looked at polling numbers about support for Huey Long's, uh, which was basically authoritarianism of the left, Maduro, uh, he said he's the most dangerous man in America. And FDR moved left and more radically populist in his appearance to, to deal with that. But he gave hope. And so your, the answer for me to your question is we're waiting for an FDR. We're waiting for someone who can rise above this incredibly polarized moment in our politics and be trusted by the moderate right, the center, and the moderate left. And I don't think it's the guy who sold us Starbucks. Uh, I, I think... I think I don't think anyone announced for president has yet risen to that. Uh, they're not all done. They barely just announced. Someone could do that. Uh, is, is, it, is it possible that a paladin of the same conservative movement could rise up and challenge Trump? I don't see that in the data. Uh, so I think that's a fairy tale of epic proportions. Uh, but maybe after Trump, because we need a sane conservative party that, that could emerge, but but we don't have that person, and we certainly don't have that institution as of yet. Jeremy Mayer, that's interesting because one of the things is you know we're talking about. I'm mentioning two years ago we were thinking about this. Now it's two years later. When we when you say that, I think to myself, why is it taking so long for for these? Why is it taking so long for these patterns to coalesce? You know, um, quickly. About ten, we've had about ten, twelve, twelve to twenty more years of populism. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> but with, uh, the instability in the e economy, even though it's doing really well, mm -hmm. it also just recently did really bad. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uncertainty of our new economy and, uh, you know, the, the technological revolution. We're, we're creating new things all the time that are, like, really convenient and wonderful and make the world better, but they also eliminate, I don't know, about a thousand jobs a day. So, you know, that instability is probably going to go on for at least 12 years, if not 20. Populist movements typically last about 20 years, and we're just at the beginning. I want to bring it back to the journalism th thing, too, because as we look at the long view and sort of see, you know, how you, you're mostly shocked trying to, you know, regain our footing or, you know, folks who are st still journalists regaining your footing and the future of, the future of journalism is part of the title here. You mentioned you're a former journalist, so am I. Other former journalists in the room, folks who've been um, maybe like uh, just a very sort of I can crowdsource just of you folks who've, who've been journalists. Like, I think it's like two years ago I might have asked you, how, how many of you recognize your profession today? So let me ask you that now even. How many of you recognize your profession today? All right. You do? Okay. I'm, I'm asking the former journalists here. <laughs> just mess with you. No, really. Um, so, so most of I didn't see a, a ton of hands. Uh, uh, that is. Why, <laughs> well, the reason I mention this, and, and feel free to grab a mic or something if you have a thought on this. Any of uh, from the subset of of you folks who used to work in journalism. The reason I mention it is because you have worked in that field and you're apart from it, and it's no longer just saying, "Wow, looking." How do we recognize it? You know, we don't recognize our industry. So I want to ask you now that you've sort of been steeped in the reality we've all been in the past few years, especially, how do you think it can be fixed or who could, to her question, like who could fix it? So maybe just, just some thoughts from folks who used to be in the industry, maybe a inside slash outsider perspective on that question, how to fix it or where will that role go if it's not journalists? Can you hear me? Yeah. So... And tell me where you worked. Where'd you work? Okay, so I was a military journalist, Stars and Stripes. Um, but then I became a public affairs officer, and I was dealing with um, journalists, media that were dealing in the Pentagon. And I knew that there was a big change 
that had already occurred when I had, and I mentioned this to somebody at lunch, that a reporter was telling me, um, and we were talking about it, was telling me that uh, they were going to run with the story that I said, you don't have all of the information. I need another half an hour, hour, because first report's always wrong. And they were like, it's okay. We'll just go and run in a correction. We have to be first out the gate. But anyway, just, just in the interest of time, how, do you, how would you fix it, right? Like how? So the, the point being earlier where somebody was saying, you know, have a license for journalists, I, I think there, there were always journalist ethics. There's always the standards there. I know there's they're always no been journalistic longer, license. They're no longer <laughs> following them because it's a business profit model. Yeah. It goes back to what you're saying. There's, there's no viable way for them to go ahead and, and stay alive out there. They got to get back to the truth, though, and the objectivity, which is what's taught in school still. But when you get to the reality of it, that doesn't happen. Okay. Up uh, right. If you pass that mic up. No, no. Serge. Yeah. Just just a few examples, because I'm in Colorado, so when you mention like the demise of local journalism, I definitely see that in Colorado. So what was your background, just so they know? Oh, a national correspondent here in D.C. Um, or? For, for AP and other, some foreign radio networks, too. Um, but I w a few things that I'm seeing, new emerging trends in, for example, Colorado. One is where there's a tremendous growth in newsroom is actually with the NPR local stations. They're doubling their newsrooms, which is great. So there's great public investment in more, I've noticed it, in uh, local NPR type stations, public radio, that's one. Two, um, the uh, reporters who were at the Denver Post who left, which was a digital first owned them, and they're the company that buys up cuts and, you know, it's just, is their newsrooms are bare bones and they buy up community papers. So there was an exodus from the Denver Post. They've started up um, a, a new newsletter called Colorado Sun. It's tremendously popular. They've had great success. Um, so I see that is also kind of an, just an investment, the public investing, those people who actually, you know, care. The third option, which, um, you know, you know, a lot of externalists joke about is we need more Bezos. We need more Bezos to buy up, you know, people like that to buy up kind of papers in some of those key cities across the country. So that's just some of the emerging trends that I'm seeing. Could, could I add to that just a brief? There's, there's another trend that's out there to try and solve this problem, and that is nonprofit journalism. So there are groups that are out there doing what journalists used to do with former investigative journalists like ProPublica. And they're, they're allying with small and large newspapers and with radio stations. That is, I think, part of the future of journalism. They do the kind of investigative work that Steve lamented, uh, rightly disappearing. And, and then the other thing about this is we are in a golden age of journalism in podcasts. Uh, what In the Dark did with the man that was tried six times for a murder he manifestly did not commit down in Mississippi. If you doubt that, listen to the episodes, second season of In the Dark, some of the finest journalism in the last 25 years. And it's done in a small town where a local prosecutor tried to kill a man and almost got away with it. So there's, there's two other trends. The other, uh, and I, I, I gotta say, you probably have the distinction of sitting in the most remote spot for microphone All right, right. So, delivery. Uh, so, delivery. So welcome, welcome, yeah, to, welcome to our group. I don't believe in the future of podcasts because there is no business model behind podcasts. And the problem is that the journalism as institution most likely will die. So it's, we are accustomed to do live through crisis and it's kind of cyclic. Uh, process so now it's bad but tomorrow it will be good but the future didn't promise to be good so it possibly we are um, uh, absorbing the end of the era and probably to live with this idea will be easier uh, as I worked as a journalist for 20 years in Russia and I stopped doing it uh, for some other reasons because of some local reasons but I think the the processes are global so what happened in 2000 zeros in this decade, social media emancipated people's authorship. And the media lost the monopoly over agenda setting. And it turned out to be that the business of the media was not content, was not information, but the monopoly over, over information. And now people can communicate to each other directly, and then uh, some other entity 
uh, not intermediary, but direct kind of sort of democracy appeared here in the internet. And we probably uh, can look at the problem of populism from this side. So it's not populism that inherits those ancient Greek or Roman kind of populism or, or the United States 19th century sort of populism. In my opinion, the modern populism, the first uh, phenomenon or manifestation of that kind of populism was uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. That was the first movement which nature was anti-establishment. So young people, mostly student, mostly well-educated, mostly urban, were facilitated and empowered by social media, by blueberries, and they start fighting elites. And then same processes were uh, developed in uh, Egypt, Libya, Arab Spring, Ukraine, Turkish, and so on. So we observed the wave of anti-establishment movement around the world at the same time. Uh, then happened next, the social media and the uh, gadgets, devices, so, um, they spread it deeper and wider into social pyramids. So they switched in terms of social basis behind that. So in 2009, 10, 11, these were young, educated, uh, intelligent, progressive, uh, almost all students, people who were behind this anti-establishment movement. In 2016, Brexit, Trump, uh, these were less young, less educated, less urban, less progressive people who were the same emancipated by the social, by social media environment. And they revealed that they can uh, shape their own agenda. And this agenda does not feed that agenda that they can see in the media. So in fact, it wasn't political conflict. It was the morphological conflict between two types of agenda setting. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I am conscious of time here, and I want to make sure that it's almost like the narrative emotional arc of our, of our time here together really follows what I feel um, in, in, in looking at this, this whole past few years, uh, which is this, I've heard this word hope, um, and in some of the, like, the success stories that you've seen, um, basically getting our head around the situation and learning to, you know, make some progress. And this ties to something somebody asked me yesterday, which was, um, because again, you know, my, my work day in and day out is as at, a, at an agency that does a lot of PR, does a lot of messaging, does a lot of reputation management for a lot of, um, clients, you know, um, in different sectors. And so someone was asking me, like how can char these character assassination topics, how can we get them, how can we shunt them into the mainstream? How can we graft these discussions that we have periodically into the kinds of discussions that are happening all the time in agencies and large organizations that are getting funded? So how can we tie what we're doing to you know, mainstream funding and mainstream acceptance into some of these related disciplines that we have in strategic communications? From media training to reputation management to consults to uh, communications planning in advance. I mean, these, you know, the principles that we were here talking about, I mean, the more they get infused in existing collateral and existing pieces of communications uh, practice, the easier. Um, so, and how do, we, how do we do this? How do we sort of position all of what we're learning in, into a form that's digestible to these forms in a way that still respects you know, the integrity and what's unique about character assassination. So I'm going to ask right now, uh, in the context of this discussion, I was starting to say, when the mainstream here is character and reputation management, it makes sense. And then in, it's a frame of reference for us to talk about all of these things about character assassination and populism. When the mainstream here is character assassination, they're not sure it applies to them. What do you think? I, I, I see a reaction here, and I really want reactions here. The difference between t talking about character and reputation management and, and when we talk about character assassination. So the concept, the future, we talked about the future of journalism, we talked about the future of populism, and I want to know about what's the future of character assassination, how to spread the concepts how to meet, meet it with the mainstream, um, and how to navigate questions that I've heard, that I've had fellow colleagues talk about when I talk about character assassination, they scratch their heads. But when I'm talking with a Booz Allen person or a Deloitte person, I talk about character and reputation management, and here are some examples, 
in this particular field. Like, wow, what a great, I'm telling them, I'm talking about the same exact thing, but I'm positioning it in a way where it makes sense to their world. So, so if you Google my name, the first three stories are a dumpster fire. Why? Because my character was assassinated by an anonymous Twitter account. That's the world we live in today. They tried to completely destroy my life. Had I not had the backing of my publisher, Penguin Random House, of CNN, of the Washington Examiner, and the New York Post, I would now be a 60-year-old unemployed woman. This is what people do to other people. This is what people in PR have to think about every day. And this is what you, I mean, that, that is what social media does. It didn't matter the, the, what they said was a complete lie about me. But I, I always have to tell someone, if they're going to look me up, I'm like, my name, first three stories, dumpster fire. None of it's true, but it didn't matter. And to your point about, uh, about a reporter coming to you and you saying, but this, you don't have the whole story. It didn't matter. The Huffington Post wrote a story about me that had no facts in it that were correct. But it didn't matter because they wanted to run the story. It's a very dangerous, scary time that we live, live in. And I, I, worry, I worry about other journalists that they do this to. But I worry about companies that can be destroyed mm -hmm. because of this. This is, this is not healthy at all. I think ultimately, and this gets back to the uh, to the comment from the audience a moment ago, the success of this enterprise depends on us as news consumers becoming effectively the gatekeepers that we have dispensed with in the modern social media environment. You have a situation where so many people will repost or retweet something because they wish it were true without any real serious consideration of whether it's even plausible. Uh, th those of you who live in the Washington area, there was this big story about Pizzagate uh, that you may recall about this idea that Hillary Clinton was somehow running a pedophile ring. And as absurd as it may be, it became part of the narrative of the campaign of 2016. And so the reality of the social media environment, and this is one of the reasons why I think it's so, so dangerous that these traditional media uh, outlets are facing such difficult financial situations, is because what is there to counter the popularity? I mean, once upon a time, there was a market. If you wrote a story in a newspaper, there was a financial consequence to it being wrong. There was a financial consequence to the company if something had gone wrong, so they had an incentive to get it right. But if somebody's posting online anonymously, there is no financial incentive, there is no punishment, there is no real consequence. You can simply create a new account with a new name, and you're as anonymous before as you were the first time. And so even if you're, I, you're targeted in that rare occasion that Twitter or Facebook decides you're account is problematic, you just simply create a new one from a new IP address and the game plays again. And so in this environment, we have to ask a lot of ourselves. And you know, in many ways, as I think about this panel, uh, we should include audience on the list of what we need to think about because ultimately the future of the media, the future of populism, the future of presidential character, a lot of that ties back to what we news consumers think are important, what we're willing to accept as credible, what we're willing to dismiss as incredible. And we're on our own. And that's problematic. How many of you, if, it's, if you feel comfortable raising your hand, how many of you ever feel you've endured character assassination personally in your life? And I'm going to raise my hand. And if you haven't, we'll provide it right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what it feels like, just, you know. Yeah. Okay. It's horrible. I've been through it. There's re I mean, that's, there's reasons why I commit my time to this, this group. And I do think it's, it's also something that can happen to anyone. Think about that kid wearing the MAGA hat, the MAGA hat at the Lincoln Memorial. He's yeah. just there with his, all his buddies from high school, and someone, we don't know who, edited an extremely deceptive short video mm -hmm. that made him look like he was deliberately harassing an elderly Native American veteran, right? And that's, I watched that video and I thought, what a jerk. 
my, my instant reaction, because that's the way the video was edited. And then you look at the long video and you go, no, I'm the jerk. And by the way, the same thing just happened in New Hampshire. Those state legislators that were wearing pearls to mock grieving mothers of gun violence victims never happened. A woman who's a gun control activist, a cause I agree with, sent out a deceptive tweet. Those pearls are associated with women who are pro-gun in New Hampshire. And so these men were wearing it to say not all women are for gun control, which is a legitimate point to make with a symbol. But and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm just gonna, I know we only have yeah. 10 more minutes, so right. I definitely wanna get a few more questions in if that's, if that's all right. I think there was a, Eric, you had a question? Questions possible. Uh, uh, we know about the, the college scandal, and so the past two days, uh, honestly, I was approached three times when people ask you, where did your son go to school? Called Cornell and Stanford. How much are you paying bribes? Oh, 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 oh. I know, I know. It's, it's just it's not funny still. Do you think that uh, we talk about character assassination? <laughs> Stanford number one. Stanford what does that say about your character that you didn't Stanford invest that way? Exactly, exactly. Uh, Stanford law. <laughs> Uh, uh, but uh, do you, don't you think, is it just a question to our esteemed, esteemed uh, colleagues, that that's the scandal will be framed uh, in, in the way that uh, uh, Fox News will likely say, uh, and, and people who support Fox News, uh, that's a typical uh, hypocrisy of liberalism. So hypocrisy is liberal uh, feature. And others will say, no, 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 it's greed. And greed is, 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 a, is a, the other side feature. So do you think the same scandal will be framed differently by, by different networks? Just to, to simply just convey a character attack on, on, on certain personality features. Well, I work for CNN, but I watch all of them because I feel like it, it broadens. You, you should look at all sides. I think it's really important. Pretty much everyone has been framing it the same way in that uh, wealthy people uh, who have the means uh, that want to do something like this, not all wealthy people, but I think it's more of a we wealthy, not wealthy, than liberal, not liberal. I, I, I really don't think this is one of those moments where you can say it's a liberal or a conservative thing. This is more about they have money, they have privilege, and they used it than a, a political side. Mm -hmm. Want to just get a, try to get a couple more questions, and I think you raised... Uh, oh. Separate, separate from viewing populism as an ideology, it, it appears that it's rooted in, in real concerns and issues that people face. Uh, Health care, for example, was a very powerful issue in the 2018 midterms. It's likely to be a very powerful issue in 2020. Uh, Ninety percent of Americans think that some degree of background checks are reasonable for gun ownership. And there are a variety of other issues like that that, that that are actually probably going to be what's going to determine the outcome of 2020. Uh, it's, it's likely, and I think you indicated this there, that we will probably face the possibility of a recession yeah. by 2020. Yeah, I think that here's what I think we're all missing is that that both parties are fully engaged in populism. They're different. There's conservative populism, which put Mr. Trump in the White House, but there's liberal populism. Uh, I wouldn't even call it liberal, more progressive um, populism that is, you know, talking about free health care, that's talking about free college. And, 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 um, and so both parties are really deeply engaged in it. Uh, the Republicans weren't prepared for what happened to them. Um, and I, 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 I would hope that at this point, I've been writing about this for four years, the Democrats have the same problem within their base. Their base, base is also not really happy with the institution or the establishment within their party. I spend most of my time on the road driving across the country. Last year I put 52,000 miles on my, on my car. So I'm out there talking and more importantly listening to people and it is across the board, but I don't know that Washington has grasped that yet. All right, another question right up here. We've got time just for one or two more questions. I have a question that kind of ties a lot of the pieces that you've talked about together and asks a question about kind of looking forward. So you've talked about the exhausting of the antibodies of truth tellers, the death of local papers. We've talked about the skewed views of media and news. Um, 
And then the American dream kind of making people vote against their own interest because they kind of vote as if they will have higher money, higher incomes than they actually do. And when you have the angles of populism that do ring true for them where they're talking about higher education funding or gun control, um, thinking ahead to the, say we have finally the candidate that embodies the hope that gets across the different party platforms. How do you think so this is 10 years in the future or 20 years if that's how long the populist wave is gonna last, how will media play a role in helping the electorate get through their cognitive dissonance so that they can actually vote for the person who does embody all those things instead of kind of reverting back and voting for another Trump-like or a candidate that gets at the, the heart of the populist emotion rather than the vision of the future? Well, I'm not so sure they will. I think that when you look at the news business, you see a very, very clear bias towards the trivial. They don't cover issues because there isn't a market for it. There isn't, other than the occasional, you know, long-form journalism in podcasts or public radio where the audiences are relatively small, you really don't see the investment in policy coverage. It's much more about horse race and character and the gaffe of the day than it is about anything about what any of these candidates would do if they actually won and had to govern. That reality has been with us for decades, and it seems to be getting worse as social media pushes us in a much more trivial direction each cycle. It's also the case, I think, and this is something uh, with respect to the way that the Trump presidency manages the news, they also push away from issue coverage. I mean, one of the things that I found really interesting uh, about the Trump presidency and media is the extent to which those morning tweets are basically the assignment editor for Washington reporters for the day that follows. And so whatever insult or snarky remark is, uh, is there out of the gate when the reporters come into work in the morning, that shapes the conversation. And so we don't have a conversation about how do we actually rebuild American cities where there aren't enough jobs for working class people? How do we figure out a way to come up with a plan that protects our elections? How do we figure out a way to create an educational system that gives people the tools to succeed in a world that is changing so much faster than it used to? I mean, these are real questions that even rich countries like the United States have to face. But with the media focusing on the latest insult or looking at the latest poll, we're not having that conversation, and social media is not a cure for this particular ailment. All right. Well... We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much to uh, 